This is Pacifica Radio's Letters on Politics. On today's show, Theodosius the First or Theodosius the Great, um, was, was an emperor starting in 379, and he was a very gung-ho Christian. And what, what he did is he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't pass a law saying Christianity is the only religion. What he did is he started passing laws making it illegal to practice paganism. And so he shut down pagan temples and he made it uh, illegal to perform pagan sacrifices. And that, in effect, shut down paganism. And after that, uh, Christianity just, just started overwhelming the world. A history of how the Roman Empire went from being a polytheistic pagan society that now and then persecuted Christians to a Christian society that then would persecute everyone else. And also about the spread of Christianity throughout the Western world. Our guest is Bart D. Ehrman. He's a renowned religious scholar and he is the author of the book, The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. That's next on Letters and Politics. Good day and welcome to Letters in Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. A fascinating and perhaps instructive story is the history and how the Roman Empire went from a polytheistic pagan religious society that at times, but not all the time, persecuted early Christians to a Christian religious society with a tendency of persecuting pagans, though they were not called pagans at the time. It's an important story, too, considering that this transformation is a big reason why the Western world would become a Christian one, whether we consider ourselves Christian today or not. The history of this transformation is what we will be in conversation about today. My guest is renowned religious scholar Bart D. Ehrman. Bart D. Ehrman is a distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he is the author of a number of books, including his latest one, which is on this topic. It's called The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. Bart D. Ehrman is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed your book, actually, and I, we, we hardly ever get to read the entire books when we do this, but I read most of it and uh, enjoyed it very much. And I found it interesting in your introduction how you point out that if the Roman Empire had not become a, a, a Christian empire, which it was possible it wouldn't have happened, that even our world today would be quite different than the one we know Right. No, it would have, it would have been massively different. I mean, you just think about uh, you, you think about how important the Christian Church was throughout history. The early Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, the the uh, the Renaissance, the Reformation, I mean, and just historically, politically, it was very important. But if you just think in terms of culture, I mean, uh, our our uh, our art. Our music, our literature, uh, if, if the world had not become Christian but had remained pagan, all of that would have been incalculably different. How, how so? Well, uh, just, well, think about just go to any museum and look at Western art uh, from the Middle Ages up into the Renaissance. It's all it's all religious. It's religious art, and it's about uh, Christ and and the stories of the Bible, and that that's the tradition that we have inherited. Or or music. I mean, Baroque music develops out of earlier music forms, which develop out of earlier music forms, and it all goes back to Christian music in the Middle Ages. And so our music would be different, our literature would be different, our art. Would would be different. Our philosophy would be different, and uh, so it's a it's an enormous transformation that took place. That's right. We would have never had a Reformation, so there would have never been a Martin Luther, perhaps. That's right. No, absolutely. And and the reality is, we wouldn't have modernity as we know it. We'd have we'd have something else. Uh, I'm not sure if it'd be better or worse, but it would be very very different. It would be very different. And that that's fun to think about, and also. I think, again, important why this story is important and, and how did this happen in this period and what it happened about. And again, that's what we're going to talk about. So let's get right into it. Um, commonly, the story of Rome becoming Christian is the story of Constantine uh, and Constantine's conversion in 312, the year 312. Uh, and, you know, the story goes that this is a mist, uh, a civil war within the empire 
Constantine is marching upon Rome, and it's fascinating just looking throughout history how many figures uh, march on Rome from uh, uh, Julius Caesar, I guess, all the way to Benito Mussolini. Well, anyways, Constantine is also uh, marching on Rome, and as he's doing that, the the popular story here is that he he sees a, a cross or something in the sky that also is accompanied with a saying that with this you will conquer and that's sort of the beginning and, and which, which he would end up doing uh, and hence this is the beginning of of how rome would become christian how, how accurate is, is that story well it, it really is an important story because um because constantine of course was the first roman emperor to become a christian and after he became christian the uh, uh it was it was later that christianity became the the religion of Rome, and so it's important to know about it. What's interesting about the Constantine's conversion is that we we have three accounts of this vision that he had, um, and all three accounts are written by people who knew Constantine. So these are not these are not accounts written hundreds of years later by people speculating about it. All three people got their information from Constantine directly. the The problem is that these three accounts uh, they they certainly have a lot of things in common, but there are also discrepancies among the three. And so one of the challenges of scholarship is to figure out uh, can we can we determine what what happened? Um, one of these accounts talks about. Constantine having a vision of Apollo, <laughs> the, the the Greek god uh, Apollo, uh, and uh, determining to worship only Apollo, and the other two are uh, visions about him having visions of Christ and and the cross, uh, and so one what historians try to do is figure out what's going on with these various visions. Is, is it possible? And of, you know, of course, it, it's probably hard to tell for sure. But is it possible that Constantine just gave different versions of this account? Yeah, that's one option, uh, and it's it's interesting because these accounts are written at different times, even though they're by people who knew him. And so the first account is by a pagan uh, speechwriter. He's giving a, a kind of speech called a panegyric, which is a, a speech that praises the subject as the greatest human being the universe has ever seen. <laughs> we, we have a lot of these panegyrics directed toward a lot of people. And so there's this panegyric about uh, to a Constantine, which says that he, um, after a military engagement, he uh, had this vision of Apollo, who, who uh, had him several laurel wreaths, which, each of which represented 30 years, uh, which meant that he was going to have a preternaturally long life. Uh, and he decided, okay, this is the God for me. And he began worshiping uh, Apollo then as the sun God, the unconquered sun. Uh, later, we have an account uh, by a uh, an author, Lactantius, who had been appointed as uh, the tutor for Constantine's son. And so he was somebody closely connected with the family. And he indicated that uh, actually what happened was that uh, he he was instructed uh, in a dream. Constantine was instructed in a dream before his battle at the Milvian Bridge to draw a sign of the cross on the shields of the soldiers going into battle, and he did it, and they won. <laughs> and so he decided that the sign of the cross was significant, and this this developed his idea that he was a uh, that he needed to be committed to the cross of Christ. Um, about 30 years later, there's a, another account by Eusebius, the church historian, who says that Constantine had two visions, one of the cross in the sky, uh, which over which said, by this conquer, and then a second by Christ himself appeared to explain what it was all about. And according to Eusebius, what happened at that point is Constantine gave up his pagan ways and became a Christian. So my guess is that Constantine probably had several visions, uh, and that uh, the first one to, to the pagan uh the the panegyrist relates was when Constantine became a henotheist somebody who was still a pagan i mean he admitted there were other gods but he only was going to worship one the unconquered son and uh, s-u-n son and then later a couple years later he had another vision and in that vision he decided that christ was the unconquered son s-u-n uh and so he moved from being a pagan to be a christian at that point and interesting, but perhaps not surprising, that one of these three stories is rooted still in pagan uh, mythology or p- uh, pagan uh, tradition with, with Apollo. Uh, and I guess that's not surprising because Rome actually didn't become a, a Christian empire at this point, even with Constantine, even though Constantine became Christian. 
Well, there are two things that people commonly misunderstand about Constantine. Uh, one is widely misunderstood that it's just a factual error. Uh, people, const, uh, people regularly say that Constantine um, made Christianity the official religion of Rome, and that's just wrong. Uh, that's not true. He didn't do that. Christianity did not become the official religion until the end of the 4th century under the reign of Theodosius I. Uh, so Constantine didn't make Christianity the state religion. What he did is he made it uh, an acceptable religion uh, during a period in which it had, been, it had been being persecuted by the Roman authorities. So that was one thing that people get wrong. The other thing people get wrong is, uh, in my opinion, this, this one is less a factual uh error than it is, I think, an error of interpretation. People often think that the reason Christianity became so dominant in the Roman Empire was because of Constantine's conversion. And what I argue in my book is that probably the Roman Empire would have been taken over by Christianity even if Constantine had not been converted. Why is that? Why why do you think that? Well, so what I do in the book is I show uh, why Christianity was growing at the rate it was, and if you actually map out the rate of Christian growth, um, it's growing at a, about at a rate of, of 3 or 4% a year. So that if there are 100 people this year who are Christian, next year there need to be 103 or 104 people. And then the next year there need to be three or four more. And the next year three or four more. And that, that's not at all an implausible rate, especially in the, in the Roman world where the, the male head of a household determined what the religion of the family would be. And so if you've, you've got 100 people in your community who are Christian and you convert one uh, head of a household in in one year, then and he's got a wife and two kids. Then all four of them start going to the Christian church and start worshiping the Christian God. And eventually, all of them are they're all Christians. And so, really, you're not talking about massive conversions here. But at that rate, at three or four percent a year, by the time you get to Constantine time, and there are three million Christians in the world, then three, a three or four percent every year. That's a significant number. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you're talking, you're talking about many thousands of people converting every year. Uh, and so, uh, the rate of growth, if you just map it out as an exponential curve to see where the population is going to go in the next 50 or 60 years, about half the empire is going to be Christian anyway. Why are people converting to Christianity? To, to get to that question, it, it's important to understand why people practiced religion at all uh, in the ancient world. Because in order to see why somebody changed their religion, you have to see why they're practicing it in the first place. And the first point to make is that everybody was religious. Uh, there, there are very, very few people who would, we would consider to be atheists in the, in the ancient world. Uh, everybody believed in the gods, but that's the second point, is that everybody believed in the multiple gods. There, there are hundreds, thousands of gods in the Roman Empire. Um, And everybody agreed that um, it was fine to worship whichever gods you wanted to worship. Uh, These various gods were worshipped in different ways. So there there are actually hundreds and thousands of of Roman religions. And and there there are a lot of differences among these religions, but there are several things that they have in common. Uh, One of which is that uh, the religion involves certain kinds of practices. Uh, Religion doesn't involve theology very much or doctrines. Uh, There are no creeds to be said. There are no heresies, no orthodoxies. Um, And ethics actually isn't part of the religion at the time. Um, How you behave was very important, but not not religiously it was important if you're going to if you want to live a good life you want to live properly but that had nothing to do with religion religion was about offering to the gods what they they deserve which is prayers and offerings uh, offering such as sacrifices for example animal sacrifices so these gods are being worshiped in these various ways in various places and uh uh, the reason they're being worshipped is because the gods can provide for things that humans can't provide for themselves. So the gods can make sure that it rains. They can make sure the crops grow, that the livestock reproduces. They can uh, provide health when people are sick. Uh, they can uh, make sure that women don't try- die in childbirth. They can uh, they can make sure that you win your wars. They can make sure that the girl next door falls in love with you. I mean, the gods can do all sorts of things. They can also make and, sure none of those things happen. They And if you, if you tick them off, they may very well not do those things. And so all of this is about divine power. It's about the about the divine realm having powers that humans don't have. 
For Christians to convince somebody to stop being a pagan, one who worships other gods, uh, the, the way that has to work is you have to show that your god is powerful, in fact, more powerful than the other gods. And so it's not surprising that when you actually read what the source, the Christian sources say about why it is people converted, even people who themselves convert, telling their history, time after time after time, what they say is they converted because of the miracles. Christians did miracles. And these miracles convinced them that their God, the Christian God, was more powerful than the other gods. And if you think that the Christian God is more powerful than the other gods, then you, that, that's what you want. You want a God who can help you out, and, and this God can do it. When we talk about the gods, I really enjoyed your chapter on pagans. And they didn't call themselves pagans, as you mentioned. It's something we call. We call them now. There, there are many different religions. And it's easy to dismiss pagans as being silly or, or ridiculous. In fact, and, and having, you know, being polytheistic. And I know there was a time in my life I thought, well, that's very silly. Uh, but but the more I, I sort of dived into it, the more the more it's actually not so silly or ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous at all. I mean, uh, you know, until Christianity came along, um, virtually everybody was a polytheist for not just for a few decades or something, but for millennia since since human history started. So uh, the only ones in the Roman world who were not polytheistic were Jews, and Jews made up maybe 5 to 7% of the population. So we're talking about 93% of the population, and it's not that 93% people, 93 of the population was just really stupid. Uh, in fact, we're talking about extremely brilliant people who believe in many gods. And that was just commonsensical for ancient people. Uh, there are gods who serve different functions. There are gods of war and of love and of uh, uh, of um, healing and of crops and uh, the gods of the home and gods for all sorts of things and, and gods for various places. Every forest has a god. Every mountain has a god. Every river and spring has a god. So there are gods everywhere with different functions, different places, and they all deserve to be worshipped. And this was just common sense. Christians and, and Jews, to some extent, were, were made fun of for being so silly themselves, thinking there could be only one God. I mean, for ancient people to say you can have only one God is kind of like saying you can have only one friend. You know, it's like, uh, no, you can only have one. <laughs> well, but there's all sorts of people I could be friends with. No, no, you can only have one. And that, that's how people thought about the gods. As you said, uh, the practicing of pagan religions was very much about the, that the actual practice rather than belief. It wasn't about faith it was about the rituals and and our word cult actually comes from this i learned this from from your book uh that the word cult means i i believe the care of the gods that's right it comes from the latin phrase cultus de orum the care of the gods we we have this use of the word cult in english where we say uh, agriculture uh, agriculture is the care of the fields uh cultus de orum is the care of the gods and so when a historian uses the term cult they're simply referring to religious practices in honor of the gods so they don't they don't mean anything negative by it i do find it interesting that words like cult or even dictator or tyrant all the that have ancient meanings uh were actually not seen as negative terms in the ancient world as, as they are today. And in fact, you, you say, take the word democracy, was that, that was more of a negative term back in the ancient world. Yeah, well, to a lot of people, especially uh, people who didn't believe in it. <laughs> right. Again, we are in conversation with Bart D. Ehrman. He is the author of the book, The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. We are talking about how the Roman Empire uh, became a Christian empire and then how that obviously would affect uh, life all the way up in, in today, the, the world that we'd understand it today. Um, talking about the persecution of Christians before Christianity overcame the empire, and, and I've heard it said many times, and I think you suggested here, it, uh, the, the persecutions didn't happen as often as, as we, we may think today, um, but they did happen. And what were the persecutions of Christians, if, if the Emp Roman Empire was this polytheistic, uh, tolerant of other religions, so then the question is, obviously, why was there the persecution of, of Christians and Jews? Is the reason because they didn't participate in the rituals and hence had what would anger the gods, which would then, uh, you know, obviously be harmful to the rest of society. Yeah, that, that's the 
that's a very uh, common view of the matter, and there's a lot to be said for it. You, you know, Jews actually were very rarely persecuted in the ancient world. Um, in the Roman Empire, there was no problem with being Jewish. Um, and it was known that Jews didn't worship the Roman gods or, uh, or really more than just their own god. Uh, in their case, though, that was acceptable because Jews obviously had a very ancient religion. And nothing was respected more in antiquity than antiquity. Uh, and so if you're in the ancient world and you had ancient, an ancient philosophy, an ancient religion, ancient customs, those were acceptable because of their antiquity. And Jews certainly had that. Um, Christians came along and they, they didn't have antiquity. They worshiped, they worshiped a man who was crucified, you know, a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. Uh, this is a recent thing. So they don't, they don't revere the Roman gods. Uh, the gods who made the state great and who support the state and who make life worth living and make it even possible, uh, they don't worship those gods. Those gods can get quite angry if they're not tended to. Christians aren't tending to them. And they don't have an excuse that they're following an ancient religion because they don't, it's not an ancient religion. And that's I think that's one of the large reasons why um, Christianity was persecuted, as even some of the Christians themselves say. And Tertullian, the, the early third century church father, Tertullian, Tertullian uh, has this famous uh, statement that if the uh, if the rivers of the Nile don't rise, or if there's flooding somewhere else, you know, if there's if there's this disaster or that disaster, immediately the cry goes out: Christians to the lion. <laughs> In other words, you know, it's the Christians' fault for any disaster, and so that's why they're being persecuted. And that's probably why there were sporadic persecutions uh, here and there throughout the empire. And. You also said sporadic persecutions. Is there a tendency to believe that it was more common than it was? Well, I think the problem is that people get their information about uh, early Christianity from watching some old bad movies from the 60s <laughs> where Christians are uh, declared illegal and they have to go in hiding in the catacombs to escape the persecution. And uh, it, it's none of that's true. Christianity was never declared illegal. There never was an empire-wide persecution of Christianity until, until around the year 250. Uh, so the earliest Christians uh, were not they, – they, they weren't illegal. There, there weren't any kind of Roman-wide laws against being a Christian. What happened was that uh, the, the way the Roman Empire worked was very different from the way the United States works, where, where we have – we have laws. We have federal laws that determine criminal activity so that it doesn't matter where you are. If you if you murder somebody, there's a law about that. And so uh, uh, in the Roman world, there was very little by way of criminal law that was in effect throughout the empire. Criminal activity was determined on a local basis. Uh, and so there there was really no mechanism for most of the history of Christian, early Christianity for it even to be declared illegal. Uh, Illegal is just that in one place or another, there is an official who thought that the Christians were troublemakers, or they were a dangerous society, or they, uh, you know, they, they were being irreverent to their gods, and so uh, because of those local local conditions, they'd be persecuted. Getting back to Constantine, and of course he would move sort of the center of the empire to Constantinople, which was named after Constantine, which is modern-day Istanbul uh, in Turkey. Um, when he became Christian, and, and as he is a, a Christian, as he's emperor of the empire after this the Civil War, um, is is Christianity a majority of, or people within the empire now Christian, or is he practicing a minority religion yet is still the emperor? He's very much practicing a minority religion. Um, what I try to uh, argue in the book is that when Constantine converted, um, there's probably three or four million Christians in an empire of 60 million. Um, and so uh, it's after Constantine that the masses start flooding in, and that's why everybody thinks that it's because of Constantine that the empire became Christian. But as I was saying earlier, th given the growth rates of Christianity uh, at the time, it might be 30, 35 percent every decade uh, you're seeing an increase of Christians. So that if you've got, um, you know, if you've got 10 million Christians, uh, then you're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of people converting all the time without without Constantine having to do much. What Constantine did is um, once he converted, he uh, 
passed a decree with his co-emperor uh, to make Christianity an acceptable religion. Uh, and so there was a... Um, there was a decree that went out that uh, that's called the Edict of Milan, uh, went out in 313, that brought a halt to a persecution that had been going on for 10 years. Uh, in the early 4th century, there was a sustained uh, effort by uh, one of Constantine's predecessors, Diocletian. There was this uh, this effort to stamp out Christianity. Uh, it failed miserably. Constantine converted during that persecution, uh, which was being enforced sporadically here and there throughout the empire. So it was enforced especially in the eastern part of the empire. Uh, but Constantine then declared a peace and made every religion completely legal and licit. And, uh, but what he started to do was to shower favors on the church, on the Christian church, because he himself was a Christian. And so he started giving power and land and resources to bishops of major churches throughout the empire. And they built gorgeous cathedrals with this money. And they, they, uh, they used the land to bring an income to the church. And the church began to be very wealthy and um, to have fantastic buildings. And it, it it was seen wide, widely that, well, it's actually a good thing now to be a Christian. And so that, that obviously encouraged people who, uh, who were sitting on the fence. Constantine was also important because he ordered in year 325 what, what is known as the Council of Nicaea. Maybe I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. or Ni- Nicaea. Yeah, Nicaea. Nicaea, in, in which this is the first worldwide gathering of bishops for a council uh, because – you know, was, this is interesting because Constantine has a real interest as emperor of the Roman Empire of ensuring the unity of the Roman Empire. The church was anything at this time but unified because they were they, they had their own philosophical debates and, and factions about, um, you know, what Christianity how should be practiced and, and what it is. And, and this whole issue, and I think he saw it trivial, it, it, we'll see it trivial today, but yet what threatened to, to fracture the, the entire church church was this issue of the trinity uh and how we we see jesus christ that's right and there people commonly misunderstand what happened at the council of nicaea uh people say things like that the council of nicaea is when they decided which books would be in the bible uh that's not true uh people people get their history from reading uh, dan brown's da vinci code uh think that the council of nicaea is where they decided that jesus would be the son of god and that's not true uh everybody knew that jesus was the son of god who was a christian at the time and they had thought that for centuries uh the deal at Nicaea does seem very trivial to, to many people, and Constantine thought it was kind of trivial, but the people involved in the argument were very hot about it, and it absolutely was dividing the church, as you say. The issue was, in what sense is Jesus the Son of God? Um, there was, a, there was a, a, a popular teacher in Alexandria, Egypt, who maintained that Jesus was God's first creation, that in, an, in, his, in uh, eternity past, God the Father uh, brought into being a son, a son of God. And the son of God was Christ, and Christ then created the universe, and uh, Christ came into the world as the Savior, and he died on the cross as the son of God. But he was, but he was a secondary divinity, a subordinate divinity to God the Father. He came into existence at some time and was secondary. His The opponents of Arius argued that that was completely wrong. They argued that Christ had always existed. There never was a time when he had not existed, and he wasn't subordinate to God the Father. He was actually equal, completely equal in every way. So it wasn't that the Father was greater than the Son. The Father and the Son are equally great. Um, and so, again, I mean, it seems it might seem like, well, who really cares? I mean, he's a son of God, so it doesn't matter. He's the creator. It's, it doesn't. But the people involved in this were very hot about it, and it was splitting the church. And so Constantine called the Council of Nicaea to have leaders from around the uh, the Christian leaders from around the Roman world to come together and talk about it and to debate it and then to take a vote. And it wasn't a very close vote at the end. It was a massive majority agreed with the latter position, that Christ had always been God and he 
was equal with God. And so that became the official church doctrine. After that, once they got through that part, they had to then decide what to do about the spirit. <laughs> and so, so the doc, these debates continued on. It's not till the end of the fourth century that you get the sort of firm, hard and fast decisions about the Trinity. But the Council of Nicaea deciding on the deity of Christ, in what sense is he divine, uh, is absolutely fundamental to these Trinitarian debates. And this is important because this is then the form of Christianity that the Roman Empire would adopt and eventually seeing it the other way of of that the Father uh, and the Son were, were, were not equal and, and one uh, was was outlawed. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting history through the 4th century because Constant, Constantine was intimately involved with these debates, and he, you know, he ran this council, and uh, and so he was. He even though at first he thought it was trivial, he ended up and you know being getting into it, and and he um, strongly supported the winning side. It, it looks like he didn't really care which side was going to win. He just wanted somebody to decide what the view was going to be, and then they would enforce it. The problem was that when Constantine died, his son, Constantius II, uh, became the emperor, and he agreed with the other side. <laughs> and so so then he started to push the Arian side. And uh, throughout much of the fourth century, it was the side that lost at Nicaea that was that was in that was the dominant position. It wasn't until uh, much later, about uh, about sixty years after Nicaea, that finally uh, it worked out that uh, that the 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 anti-Aryan side became the dominant view. And then when Theodosius I became the emperor, he was strongly behind that view, and it became then the dominant view throughout Christianity. And Theodosius the Great, who became emperor, he was emperor from year 379 to 395. Um, He would make Christianity the official state religion. Can you tell me more what's important to know about Theodosius the Great or Theodosius I and and that whole process of making Christianity the official state religion? Yeah. So after after Constantine, um, every every Christian emperor after Constantine was a Christian, with one minor exception. His uh, nephew Julian, uh, known to history as Julian the Apostate, uh, had been a Christian, but he, he went back to paganism. And his idea was to turn the empire back into a pagan state. But he was killed early in his reign um, uh, in a uh, rather unwise uh, maneuver uh, in a battle against the Persians. And so uh, his successor was Christian, and then his successor was Christian. And Theodosius I, or Theodosius the Great, um, was was an emperor starting in 379, and he was a very gung-ho Christian. And what what he did is he he didn't uh, he didn't pass a law saying Christianity is the only religion. What he did is he started passing laws making it illegal to practice paganism. And so he shut down pagan temples and he made it uh, illegal to perform pagan sacrifices. And that, in effect, shut down paganism. And after that, uh, Christianity just just started overwhelming the world. We are in conversation with Bart D. Ehrman. He is the author of the book, The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. I guess that gets us now into the the, 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 the coin is flipped to the other side or, or whatever it may be, because is this when we begin to see the persecution of pagans? <laughs> yeah, this is this starts up. Uh, it may it starts up a little bit before uh, Theodosius, but it is uh, definitely with Theodosius that you start uh, finding situations that are uh, that are very uncomfortable for people who are simply practicing the religions that their ancestors practiced. Um, somebody who is a pagan at this point simply thinks, you know, I'm just I'm just doing what. Everybody's done in my family since we have any memory of our of our history, and we're. And, but but uh, now Theodosius is saying it's it's uh, it's illegal. You can't sacrifice to pagan gods, and if you can't sacrifice to pagan gods, that that's what pagan worship is. Um, he actually passed one uh, decree that said that uh, you couldn't even worship your household gods in your household. Now, there's very there's very little way to enforce that kind of thing. Um, 
especially in the Roman world. It wasn't like the, like in the United States where we act, where we have uh, the ability to send in the National Guard. Uh, there wasn't a National Guard. There were, enforcement was always very much on the local level. But it, one place after the other, uh, pagan temples were shut down, or some of them were converted into churches, or churches were built inside the confines of the of the of the temple. Um, and so basically this is forcing paganism to to uh to go away and even though they didn't have a national guard to send in there were uh there could be and were zealous uh enthusiastic christians who wanted to squash paganism and so they would go in without any authority to do so uh and destroy temples and destroy uh idols the statues and uh uh, they would um, sometimes attack pagans, and uh, we have instances of them actually uh, killing pagans in a kind of a mob, Christian mob action. I want to talk about those. This also reminds me, some of it may sound familiar. I know for us history enthusiasts, it very, was very painful to see the destruction of ancient sites in Iraq and Syria uh, at the hands of ISIS. Of course, even during the uh, Iraq war invasion by the, led by the United States, there, there were destruction of ancient sites as well. But we think of uh, Palmyra, uh, this very beautiful place in Syria in 2015. Um, we, we know ISIS was involved in destruction of, of many artifacts there. Uh, but you write, uh, d- during this period of time that we're, we're talking about, Christians destroyed a good portion of it as well. Yeah, they uh, the Christians destroyed uh, a, a major major pagan temple in uh, Palmyra. Um, it's the first, you know, the, what happened with ISIS just uh, infuriated so many of us and and saddened so many of us. Uh, but we do have a record uh, uncovered by a Polish archaeological team some years ago, uh, which was digging in Palmyra and and found uh, evidence of a pagan temple that had been destroyed in the late fourth century. Um, and among other things, they they found a, a statue to a god that had been mutilated, uh, nose cut off, genitals cut off, lips cut off, uh, ears cut off, and. That kind of destruction uh, isn't the sort of thing that happens if there's an earthquake. Uh, it's the sort of thing that happens if somebody goes after a statue with a hammer uh, or some other destructive device. And um, the reason Christians would, would mutilate statues that way is to show that the pagan gods had no power. Uh, they couldn't they couldn't say anything so you cut off their lips they couldn't hear anything so you cut off their ears they couldn't they didn't bring fertility as they're believed to bring and so they cut off their genitals they couldn't do anything so you cut off their hands and then you leave the statue maimed as a demonstration that the pagan gods are powerless in the face of the Christian God and that's exactly what they found uh, at this site in Palmyra this temple was destroyed during the reign of Theodosius the first um, it doesn't look like like it was done on the basis of some kind of official action. Uh, the archaeologists thought that this looked like it was kind of a mob violence sort of thing because there's no evidence actually of any of uh, Theodosius's officials being in that area at that time. Uh, but still, Christians are being encouraged uh, and officials are turning a blind eye and this is happening throughout the empire. And for listeners who are wondering, well, what's Palmyra? You may have seen photos of it. I, I've never been there, but I've seen photos of it and it's absolutely beautiful, well, even but still there and yeah, it's a glorious place, and I—I uh, I have to admit, I haven't been there either. Um, I had—I uh, had hoped to go there before the whole thing with ISIS uh, had had happened, and ISIS, of course, destroyed uh, a, a large number of the antiquities there. Um, so, to our shock and dismay, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, now, that, I think this brings us to Alexandria. Egypt during this period of time, Alexandria is, is you know it's a city founded by Alexander the Great, hence its name, uh, and and it's considered to be the intellectual, perhaps the intellectual center uh, of the known world. 
And with the the Christianity taking over the Roman Empire and, and the Christianization of this area as well, and you started to, to talk about this, uh, you have both the destruction of the Serapium, if I'm saying that correctly, and also the murder of Hypatia. I'd like to talk about both of those first. The destruction of Serapium was in 391. This is still very much during uh, the rule of Theodosius I. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, I think people pronounce it differently. I, I always say Serapian, but I think uh, people say pronounce it differently. And I'm sure I'm not saying it correctly. So I'll just go with the <laughs> I'm, not, it. I'm not. I'm not sure about you. I think maybe you are. But that, I always say Serapian. And so Serapis was a uh, was an Egyptian divinity, and this was the major temple. This was an enormous temple that some people thought was one of the most glorious temples on earth. Um, of equal splendor to uh, the Parthenon in Greece. Um, a large temple with an, an enormous statue of um, Serapis in it. Um, it's a long and detailed story. And I, I give some of it in my, in my book. But the short of it is that um, the pagans are being persecuted and there's a kind of a there's a there's a kind of a riot and um they take refuge in the serapium uh and they uh they end up being persuaded to come out and the christians out of anger for uh what these pagans had done uh uh enter into the serapium and uh basically destroy it and they destroy the cult statue break it off into uh all these pieces and they have it burned into different places around the city and they so they destroy this this magnificent uh structure uh and the this this uh the statue that was supposed to be absolutely fantastic um, and so this was a major event in the history of, uh, of Alexandria because it was one of the real landmarks of the city. Serapium. Serapium. And that's how I say it. If yeah. I say it enough, I'll get it. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I think I'll get this next one right. Hypatia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good enough. Yeah. Hypatia. So Hypatia was, um, Hypatia was a real rarity. She was a highly educated woman philosopher who actually had men students under her. Um, her father was one of the great mathematicians of the ancient world, and she also was very skilled in mathematics. But she took a special uh, liking to um, to philosophy and was a major philosopher in her day. Um, she, um, that's another, it's, it's another involved story, but this one, um, th- there there is some internal fighting in Alexandria between the rulers, uh, the some of the some of the pagans who still have some power, and uh, some of the Christian leaders who also now have a lot of power. And in this this split that's happening within the city, uh, there's a kind of a, a, a series of acts of mob violence, the last of which involves Hypatia. Um, she was identified as siding with one of the uh the was one of the non-christian groups and a, a mob of christians uh went after her and found her uh in public and dragged her into a temple and stripped her and murdered her with uh, apparently with uh pottery shards uh and then burned her body so um she was uh she by all counts, was the most remarkable woman, uh, mar- remarkable philosopher, scholar, and killed senselessly uh, by a mob that was just out for blood. Was she pagan? She was pagan. Yeah. And a great mathematician. Great mathematician. And her father was one of the leading mathematicians of the, of, of the period. During this turmoil that's happening in Alexandria, Egypt, dude, is this when we also see the destruction of the great library of Alexandria? We don't know what happened to the library of Alexandria or when it happened. Uh, there, there are a number of theories about it, but it doesn't appear. It, it, pro- it probably was not destroyed by Christians. Um, and it probably was not. Some people say it was destroyed during, at the, in the Islam invasion, but that's probably not right either. We're really not sure uh, what, or, what happened to it or when it happened. 
Okay. Bart Ehrman, um, your book really focuses on this period of time the, in the book, The Triumph of Christianity, uh, with the, the, the sort of the rise of Christianity with the empire, in the empire and then the adoption of it, the official adoption of it, the persecution uh, against pagans afterwards. Um, is, is it just this period of time where Christianity is firmly embedded within the Roman Empire and, and how we end up you know, getting to the Middle Ages and, and the Renaissance and, and all these things of the Reformation and all these things? Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, as Christianity is taking over, the, 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 the reason it ends up taking over like this is because of this unique feature in Christianity, which um, I guess maybe people haven't thought that much about. But the thing about these polytheistic religions that it's overcoming is that they were very welcoming of religious difference. Um, and so if you if you worship Zeus and your next door neighbor convinces you that it's a good idea for you to worship Apollo, then you simply start worshiping Apollo while you continue worshiping Zeus. You don't you don't have to choose between them. I mean, you all, they're all gods and they all deserve worship. And so that's fine. Christians insisted that there's only one God. He's our God. And if you worship our God, you cannot worship the others. And so Christians required a choice. And it was an exclusive choice, which meant that every time that a, Christ, a person became a Christian, uh, it meant that Christianity not only gained somebody, but paganism lost somebody. And it, Christianity was the only religion doing this. So that um, uh, Christianity basically was destroying the other religions in its wake. And so when you get to Constantine and you have three million Christians in the world, say, or four million Christians, that means that there are four million fewer pagans. And by the end of the century, when you've got 30 million Christians, that means you've got 30 million fewer pagans. And it just goes on like that until uh, after Theodosius I, the hordes come in, basically, the masses convert. And by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the next century, paganism is very much in the minority. And so that leads then into the Middle Ages, obviously, because you, uh, the, the people who go into the Middle Ages in the, uh, in the West are, uh, they're not pagans. They're, they're, uh, they're Christians with, uh, of course, with Islam coming in later. But, uh, but basically the West becomes a, a, a Christian, a Christian culture. It's argued by some scholars, perhaps even including Edward Gibbon, who is the great chronicler of the 18th century who, who wrote the defini- the book uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire that the adoption of Christianity was a significant reason why the empire would eventually fall. Yeah, people have argued that uh, have argued that over the years um, and uh, you know there are, it's 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 really kind of a hard hard thing to say. I mean, in my book I I talk about, you know, what would have happened if, <laughs> you know, if 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 Christianity had not taken over, uh, what would have happened? One thing that's kind of interesting about Christianity taking over, that, and again, I, I guess I should stress, I haven't said this yet, but but when I talk about the triumph of Christianity, I'm not saying that I thought I think it's necessarily a very good thing. Um, when I say triumph, I don't mean that I'm glad that it happened. Uh, in many respects, I am very glad it happened because of these cultural things that I've talked about that I, uh, like so many of us, we relish our history of literature and art and music and philosophy. These are things that we, we cherish and they, they wouldn't have happened without Christianity. We'd have a whole different set of things. And I don't know, don't know if they'd be better or worse, but I'm not, I'm not evaluating whether it's better or worse, but I will say that one of the main differences between Christ, the Christian culture and the pagan culture was that Christianity had, uh, did not have, have the same kind of ideological um, understanding of uh, of how one should live in the world. Um, in in Roman culture, there was an ideology of dominance. Uh, those who are more powerful should dominate those who are less powerful. That's why slavery was never questioned. Uh, of course, it's right to have slavery. Some people should be subservient to others. It's why men were dominant over women. Uh, it's, 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 it's why powerful nations could destroy weaker nations and never have any qualms about it. Of course they should. They're more powerful. So it had this ideology of dominance. And in that kind of society, you wouldn't expect things like uh, welfare programs for the poor uh, or hospitals hospitals for the sick uh the, the the kinds of things that developed through the middle ages in christian cultures uh where you have governmental support of the poor and the needy uh that that 
that is something that comes about with Christianity. Uh, well, so that's something else I'm, I'm, I'm glad about. But, but, some, but some people might say, well, that, that actually makes, the, makes society weak. Because instead of stressing power and dominance, you're stressing service. And it's weaker, and so of course it's going to fall apart. Uh, and so there, that 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 could be an argument. Uh, it, but again, it's hard to know what would have happened. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess with everything in it, all great, if we call it advancement or, or whatever it will be, uh, there's there's always a good and, and a negative aspect uh, that usually comes along with it. Rarely are things only good or or only bad. Uh, I, I guess one of the things I, I think of, though, and you write about this in your book, is it's during this adoption and then uh, after the adoption of Christianity that you get discrimination against Jews uh, within the empire and, and heretics, I guess, pagans or, or perhaps even immigrants who who came from Gaul or, or wherever it may be, um, were forced to return to their, their country of origin. I, it, it seems like those type of things aren't something that would be beneficial to the functioning of an empire. Well, yeah, no, that's right, and that that is very much the downside. I mean, the um, persecution of Jews is a, obviously a ongoing and um, a very serious issue. Uh, it it developed within Christian circles in uh, in the Roman world. Jews were not opposed as Jews. I mean, it's true that sometimes Romans made fun of Jews, but Romans made fun of Ethiopians and Egyptians, and they made fun of all everybody who wasn't a Roman. Uh, and so Jews weren't centered, weren't weren't, weren't singled out. And um, Romans uh, basically passed a lot of laws in favor of Jews. But the Christian emperors, uh, starting with Constantine, uh, Jews became uh, were, came to be seen as a threat that had to be dealt with. And so there's this anti-Jewish legislation that begins with Constantine and becomes quite severe under Theodosius. Uh, for your listeners who are interested in this, there, there's a lot of good books about this, but the best probably is James Carroll's book, The Con- uh, Constantine's Sword, about how with the conquest of Christianity, uh, you, you start getting this uh, anti-Jewish le- legislation and uh, considerable persecution. Yeah, we had James Carroll on a long time uh-huh. ago on that book. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not surprised. (laughs) Yeah, it's a great book. Bart D. Ehrman has been our guest. Again, Bart D. Ehrman is a distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. And he is the author of the new book that we have been in conversation about. It is called The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. Bart Ehrman, I have enjoyed our conversation very much, and and I thank you greatly for doing it. Well, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it, too. And that does it for Letters and Politics. The show is produced by Deanna Martinez. Kristen Thomas is our engineer. You can find archives of our previous shows online at kpfa.org. I'm Mitch Jezerich, and I thank you for listening.